Good evening and welcome everybody to tonight's Commonwealth Club program. My name is Scott Schaefer. I'm senior editor of KQD's Politics and Government Desk, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for this evening's program. Well, there's little debate that uh, California is undergoing a political sea change of sorts. Democrats have been solidifying power for much of the last decade in the state, but the blue wave hit California Republicans particularly hard in the November midterm elections. They lost half of their U.S. House seats every statewide election and saw Democrats gain really super, super majorities in both chambers of the California legislature. Even traditional Republican strongholds in Orange County and San Diego also turned blue for the first time, leaving the GOP with little foothold here in the Golden State. And so to discuss the recent election in the state of California, uh, the state of Republicans in California and the path forward, I'm joined by four terrific people who I have interviewed and uh, are, are looking forward to chatting with tonight. They are, from my left, former state assembly member, Catherine Baker. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> former assembly minority leader, Kristen Olson. San Diego's Mayor Kevin Faulkner. Oh, thank you. And GOP campaign consultant Matt Shoup. And our four guests have spent their careers in Republican politics and all have different views on how the party got to its current state and how to regain its strength in California. And we're excited to have them here and to discuss this important issue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome our panelists here to the Commonwealth Club. Okay, so given that this is the uh, State of the Union speech, I thought I would begin by asking each of you, in order here, you know, what do you think is the state of the GOP in California? Well, first, I'm just, uh, it's the first time in my life that Trump was the opening act for <laughs> our panel tonight, so, uh, and there's a tie to that. I think the pulse of the GOP in California is very faint. And I think there's really no other message that uh, Republicans can get from the November elections. And it has been on the decline by virtue of registration and how many seats Republicans have in this area or the other uh, for over 20 years. But it's particularly been um, the last, I think, uh, the last two years that a party that I thought was making a comeback in 2014 was uh, starting to see the opposite direction. And so I think the, the pulse is very faint and a lot of what will happen next is dependent on I think how the party responds to the election in uh, last November and what happens even the next few weeks with their own leadership in California. So faint pulse. Kristen? Sure, I'll start with the brief answer. I could talk about this for hours, but I'm sure we'll get more into the weeds as the time goes on. But I wrote an op-ed, as some of you may have seen, saying I believe the party in California right now is virtually dead. And that's not easy for me to say as somebody who spent my entire adult life in Republican politics. But the fact of the matter is, in the California State Assembly, we have fewer Republicans serving today than we've had since the 1800s. Uh, we are not in a good place as a party. And so we really have to do some soul searching. We have to acknowledge the state of the problem that we're in if there's any hope for rebuilding for the future. Mayor Faulkner? It's good to be back. First of all, I, I love the digs, by the way. A <laughs> sure. little, little different than Very nice. last nice. time I was here. Um, Welcome to Nancy ago. Pelosi's to hometown. Yeah, well, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we have a lot of work to do as a party, and I have some very strong opinions on some of the things that I think we need to be doing um, as Republicans, but, but I think most importantly as, as Californians. Um, I mentioned that I had the opportunity to, to speak to the Commonwealth Club just about a year ago, uh, where I shared some of those thoughts. And, and I, I think that when we look at particularly here in California, and why I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight, um, we cannot be a carbon copy of the national GOP. We have to be a party that is responsive to Californians. We have to be a party that is inclusive. We have to be a, a party that demands results and a party that appeals to the entire spectrum of the state. Um, that's how this party, in my view, in California, is going to get back on track. As I said at the beginning, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm I'm looking forward to sharing some of the things that we've been doing in San Diego that I think um, can serve as a template, I hope, for other things that we should be doing across the state. Matt? 
Moji out of that. And let me, let me ask a slightly different question okay. to you, slightly different. You know, what do you think are the lessons in, for California Republicans from the November elections? Well, so first off, thank you everybody for coming. I know that there's other things you could be doing tonight, so I really appreciate it. And it's always good to be back. Um, you're going to find out tonight, I'm an eternal optimist. I'm, I'm, I don't think there's a single Republican that's happy with the results of 2018 election, but at the same time, I'm definitely an optimist moving forward. Um, I think some of the results are interesting. And one thing I like to point out is in 2010, when Meg Whitman ran for governor, she had a 31% Republican voter registration, had $160 million. When John Cox ran in 2018, the Republican voter registration was 24%, and he had $15 million. Meg Whitman got 41% of the vote. John Cox got 38.5% of the vote. I think a lot of our losses were tactical and technical. I mean, between the you know, two and a half, three point difference there. I don't think there was this major pendulum swing. I think that we have an opportunity to really examine how we do things moving forward. And hopefully we take this as a learning opportunity to adapt and overcome. Uh, the Rolling Stone, you know, did a, did an article in 2008, right after Obama got elected, saying that the Republican Party was dead and George Bush killed it. A few years later, Republicans took back the House. Eight years later, they had the House, the Senate, and the presidency. This stuff comes in ebbs and flows. We definitely have much more of a challenge in California than we did in the country. But again, I think this presents an opportunity, and I'm an optimist for that. You know, I, as you were talking, Mayor, I was thinking about you, Catherine Baker, because you embodied many of the things that the mayor was describing. Somebody who reaches across the aisle, someone who is inclusive. You supported climate change legislation along with other Democrats. You held a uh, regular town hall meetings with a Democrat, Steve Glazer. Many so Democrats. Many, yeah. many town hall meetings. Uh, you supported same-sex marriage. I mean, a lot of things where if you look where are Californians, you know, you're pretty close to those positions. And yet, you lost your reelection. What made the difference? Well, you know, and any candidate who who looks back on the election and after losing is going to see what could I have done differently, what happened, and uh, fortunately, with time, you get an opportunity to look at the data and see. And I I might be a little bit different with uh, from Matt on this one in terms of I don't think it was uh, a tactical change or uh, a technical. Although I definitely think that Republican campaigns and just leaders in California can improve that. We had two primary um, feedback from folks on the ground. There's a lot of different reasons why somebody votes for you or for a different candidate, and you have to be respectful of the fact that um, they'll, they'll have their own reasons, but I can just tell you what we heard on the ground. One reason was uh, that we heard many times is, gee, I, I heard this about you. Uh, just from the mail and the hit pieces that you get, very standard in campaigns. You're, you're always going to say, gee, the other side's saying something about me that's not true. Very standard. You almost sign up for that, um, whether you like it or not, when you go into campaigns. So that's, that's fine. But I would say the majority reason we heard, uh, loud and clear, day in, day out, was I know who you are, Catherine. I like the positions that you're taking, but I cannot vote for you because you have an R after your name. And there would be some versions of that, some variety of that as well. And that was the feedback we got from a lot of folks. Again, out of respect for uh, um, people who didn't vote for me because they thought I, I didn't take the right positions or they had other reasons or they preferred the other candidate. But take that uh, to the next level. What does that mean because you had an R next to your name? Uh, the, to me, that meant the Republican brand and anything associated with the Republican Party, and I'm a lifelong member, uh, was toxic to voters um, in my district, uh, of course, in the East Bay area, and that for the most part, because of the national level, not because of my own record of service or even California Republicans and leaders, but because of where they felt a great disconnect from the national level. It was loud and clear every day. And um, I would visit with those voters about myself and what we've been working on. That's my job. And it was just a contrast with what you see elsewhere in the country. And I think this, Catherine's race, not only in 2018, but in 2016, I think is the most illustrative of the state that the party's in right now. We once thought, I led the effort thinking we could demonstrate that California Republicans are different from national Republicans. We're thoughtful, we're solution-oriented, we're pragmatic, and that we could rise above an increasingly toxic national brand. In 2016, 
2016, we did that effectively. Catherine Baker uh, beat Donald Trump on the ballot by, I want to say, 29 points. It was about right? uh, 36 points. 36 in the points. Some in parts of the district it was 58. <coughs> right? Points. So yeah. we effectively wow. were able to demonstrate <laughs> California Republicans are different. They're worthy of your support. In 2018, two years later, under two years of a Trump presidency, Catherine lost. Same candidate, if anything, more vocal about how she's distinct and unique as a California Republican, lost by two points. I mean, we are really having challenging times, and I think that race demonstrated, as did others, it's becoming very difficult, if not impossible, to rise above an increasingly toxic national brand. And we have to figure out, is there a path for that moving forward, or do we have to wait out the current dynamics uh, until there's another day? And yet, <clears throat> Mayor, uh, you know, this is a trend in California that preceded Donald Trump. Right. I mean, we've been seeing Republican registration in California going down yeah. steadily since the mid 1990s, I mm -hmm. would say. Uh, and maybe it's accelerated. Maybe it's that R has become the scarlet letter for some voters. But it's not just Donald Trump. Right. Yeah, registration has been going the wrong way for I mean, people think of, of San Diego as a Republican bastion in registration. Uh, it's not. It was when I ran for office, it was 25 percent. I think it's like 23 percent Republican now, virtually just like the state, even a point or two lower. Um, and, you know, agree when we have candidates like like Catherine and, you know, others that it is not easy in California. But I think that what Kristen was just saying uh, it makes it all the more incumbent upon us to help uh, show those differences. Because again, as I said earlier, we cannot be a carbon copy of, of the national brand. We have to be a California Republican Party that is inclusive, that welcomes everybody. We have to be a party that does talk about climate change and a party increasingly here in California that most focus on reform. Uh, one party rule is not good for a state. It's just not, it's not good. And when we, we can talk about some of the issues um, today, whether that's our financial issues, our infrastructure issues, and others, we need to show that, that, that competitiveness for ideas and to do that. And when we focus on that, um, you can win. I won with 57% of the vote in a 25% registration. Uh, not easy, but it's, it's difficult. But at the same time, the, the party's way back in California has to be a party that really is encompassing of people and, and, and ideas and demonstrating that we care. And it's not, just, it's not just you care, but you demonstrate that with your actions and your values and your policy. When we do that as a party at the state level, then we can get back to winning. Oh, Matt, I, I really yeah, want to jump in on this, yeah. actually. So I, I, I agree with everybody, and I actually want to build upon it in a way where, you know, Catherine and Kevin are examples of Republicans that can win in what are considered, you know, hostile territory for Republicans, and they did that by having strong, bold messages. I think that on the state level, we haven't gone far enough with that yet. We keep talking about standing out and differentiate ourselves, but what has been the state party or the, you know, the caucuses, the state Senate caucus, the state assembly caucus message to do so in the last eight years? And I experienced this on two different levels. One, when I was John Cox's communications director, once we made it in the general election, every report in the state wanted to have, you know, asking us questions on all our solutions to every problem in the state, I would have loved the opportunity to say, well, here's the Republican solution to homelessness. Here's the Republican solution to X, Y, Z. But I didn't have a bill package that I could point to and say, we've offered solutions to this and we're supporting on that, we're running on that. Um, now, as a county, I'm the Contra Costa County Republican Party chair, and I see the same thing in my county. If I want to go to downtown Walnut Creek at a farmer's market and do voter registration, and I want to say, yeah, I get you don't like Trump, but you know, here in California, we're different. We're actually trying to make your life better, X, Y, Z. But the thing is, I don't have an X, Y, Z to point to. I can't really point to local officials because a lot of the local Republicans in Contra Costa County or the Bay Area, which there are a lot of, don't want to be you know, outed as Republicans. And at the same time, you know, the, the, I don't have anything to point to. I want to be able to say that Republicans are working their butts off to solve homelessness in Sacramento, and there's a reason to vote for them. And I just, I feel like we have fallen flat in coming up with alterna good, viable alternatives. In the last eight years, I think we've just been the party of no, and I think it needs to change. Well, and a good example of that was some of the cap-and-trade legislation that Republicans joined with 
Jerry Brown and Democrats to uh, to renew I, I, cap and trade. But I disagree. Sorry, to, I disagree with that because that's a Democrat proposal with a, with a Democrat vote. I want to come up with. There were Republicans that voted. And I worked for one of the Republicans that were, voted for it. But my point is, what I want to see Republican legislation that offers alternatives and solutions to the problems. Well, Catherine. So Alan, Matt's right about this. Mm -hmm. When I was ahead, later, Catherine question. will remember too. He's absolutely right. We have to become solution focused leaders. We have to get away from the reputation of being the party of no. Preceding that, though, we also have to demonstrate, as Kevin said, that we care about Californians. We care about the daily struggles they're facing in the various regions of the state. We spent a considerable amount of money when I was Republican leader and vice chair of the party really analyzing what is wrong with the Republican brand in California and is it fixable? And the thing that arose more than any other item, more than any policy issue, is that Californians think we don't like them. Well, if you think somebody doesn't like you, then one, you're not going to listen to them, much less trust them with your vote. So first, we have to demonstrate we care about people. Then, once we've built trust and built relationships, then absolutely, we have to present solutions on the pressing challenges facing our day. When I was leader in the assembly, we presented actually three or four substantive policy packages on three or four different issues that were really high priority issues to the state of California in that, at that time. We have to start doing that again because people want to know what is your vision, what do you stand for, and what are you going to do if I check your name at the ballot box? How are you going to improve my daily life? What solutions are you going to offer to homelessness, to the increasing levels of poverty and income inequality, to housing costs, to transportation challenges? Don't just tell us what you're against. Tell us what you're for. And Matt, you're absolutely right. We have to get better at that as a party, not just individually, but as caucuses and at the aggregate level across the state. Just coming back to the yeah, the and, and I yeah. and, and I, I want to say Kristen is absolutely right on that, and and we we do offer solutions. We offered a, an entire education reform package. Uh, when SB1, the gas tax, came up just a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, we had, I wrote the op-ed in, in uh, uh, a major newspaper, that, that's okay. uh, and, right. and to get out there, what that was, we offered, here's a solution that we think is better. So that, that does happen in, uh, with fits and starts sometimes. I, I certainly have that complaint often at the national levels. But let's take cap and trade because it really... Um, coalesce as well with what this message is. Just let's just briefly say what cap sure. and trade is. This, go ahead. Yeah, this was a, um, a policy that was to have us reach climate change goals not by command and control mandates that an unelected board was going to impose on Californians, but instead through a trading of credits, a market-oriented solution that, frankly, Ronald Reagan was <coughs> first to employ uh, in using uh, for environmental regulation. Almost every major economist has found that this trading of credits is one of the most effective ways to protect environment and do environmental regulation. Now, this came up in 2017. The environment matters to Californians. It matters to me. It matters to our Republican heritage, protecting the environment. So addressing an issue that was high priority to Californians, the environment and climate change, and we did so in a way that applied our Republican principles, which was a market-oriented solution that was an alternative to command and control Soviet-style governing. Uh, and the seven or eight Republicans who came out and voted for that were demonstrating we are focused on a priority that matters to Californians, consistent with our principles. So I think that is what Californians need to see more from the Republican Party. Absolutely that you're addressing the issues that matter to them in a way that's consistent with what you believe. There was a raging debate in the party if that was the right thing to do. I would say actually civil war <laughs> uh, that happened shortly after that. But that's an example of where I think the party should go as well. And I do want to go back just briefly on one issue. And that was the question of, gee, the Republican Party's been in decline in California for 20 years, and it's not really just because of Trump. Yes, we have. There's no doubt about it in registration. But if you look at the registration in California, it was going down for Democrats and Republicans. It accelerated dramatically after 2016. My district is a perfect example of that and across the state. In fact, Democratic registration is pretty much leveled off. And so you can't deny the numbers on what that says. Yeah. And we should say the fastest growing party is no party, no party preference, right. which is now gone beyond uh, Republicans. It's about 26% to 24% roughly, give or take. But, you know, coming back to the, the cap and trade, because what Republicans said, Chad Mays and others was, look, we were in the room because we were willing to talk. We weren't just saying no. And we were able to get concessions from the governor, from the Democrats that made this cap and trade system more business friendly, which is what 
you know, Republicans want. And yet there was, you could talk about a civil war. I civil mean, war. there was a, the, oh. Chad Mays got run out of his job as the assembly minority leader and it was not pretty, right? So what's the message there from, and that came from the top of the state Republican party. It really is, a f look at the priorities that are in folks' lives and address those priorities and be at the table. It's, it, for me, it was the same when uh, President Trump walked out of the Paris Accords. You get more done when you're in the room and you're trying to be in the room where it happens, just to <laughs> back into Hamilton and be a part like of singing. it. So, uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think it also speaks to, and I agree with everything Catherine said, and that was a very unfortunate time and situation. But it also highlights something that's instructive to ourselves. I've talked with a lot of the people who were involved in that at the time, and it highlights the importance of messaging. Right? You can't just be at the table uh, governing, as important as that is, and shaping policy to be more market driven and more consistent consistent with long-term Republican principles, you also have to communicate with people what you're doing from the very, very beginning. And I think that we probably could have done a better job. Uh, some individuals did a much better job at that than others, but communicating with people back home and in the grassroots what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how their lives will benefit from those actions at the policy level. But Matt, are you saying that no, there shouldn't be, you know, a sort of Democrat light, if you will, that, that we need new solutions, completely new, not just getting in the room when the de Democrats are in charge, but coming up with, with ideas that, you know, that are ours and ours alone? Or I, I, think that? that's a, I think that's a third of it. I think being in the room and getting concessions is a, is a third of it. And I think that's very important. But I think another third of that, like I said, is Republicans need to have their own ideas, their own proposals <laughs> that give re people reasons to want to vote for us. And it's something we can run on statewide and locally. The other third of it, I completely agree with Kristen, is messaging. I, I'm actually kind of uniquely positioned to have some insight on that whole debacle because I was on both sides of it. I had clients, and I'm deeply involved in, this, in the party, and then at the same time, I was in the Capitol working for a member who voted for the cap and trade at the time. And so I got to see firsthand both sides of that operation, and I, I personally believe, like what Kristen said, it was messaging. And within our party, there's kind of div a division right now between the electeds and the party base, and I think that's unfortunate and fixable, and I think that's something that we need to do internally where we need to communicate reasons why we're doing things because then the the bloggers and the really vocal minority within our party can hijack narratives and because also things aren't fully explained and I think there just needs to be more kumbaya and more messaging among us. And I think we've been lacking that in the last few years. San Diego is the largest city in the country, I believe, that has a Republican mayor. And uh, you, Mayor Faulkner, were urged, I think, by some in your party to run for statewide office, governor perhaps, that uh, you would be, have been a good messenger for the party, somebody who could attract independent voters. You declined to do that. Is, is being mayor really that much fun or was there some other reason? <laughs> I do love the job. I love it so much I got on a plane to come up and talk to you about it. Yeah. Um, no, I do and I, and, and I ran on a, um, and felt strongly about finishing the job. Um, and we have a lot of work that we still have to do. Um, but, but I ran and was successful, back to a lot of what we're talking about, on, it wasn't, I'm, I wasn't running to be the Republican mayor of San Diego. Well, it's a nonpartisan office. I was office. running to be mayor of San Diego. I was running on ideas and principles that had to appeal to Republicans, to Democrats, and to that growing group of independents. And to be brilliant at the basics that we're supposed to be doing, about paving our streets, which I set a goal of that we were going to pave 1,000 miles in five years, and we did it in two and a half years. About pension reform. Uh, an issue that will absolutely crush our state if we don't do what we did similarly in San Diego, which is to address it head on. And we put it on the ballot. And in San Diego, again, with that 25% Republican registration, pension reform passed with 57% of the vote. Um, but again, back to um, policies that make sense that really make a difference in people's lives. And, and make it different, and again, not on a Democrat or Republican basis, but for our, our African American community, for our Latino community, for our LGBT community, showing how we can be inclusive and we're gonna have policies that actually move the needle and make a difference. From where you sit right now, and, and comes back to the question of, you know, should I run for statewide office, is the state Republican Party a liability or a benefit to a candidate running statewide? Look, it's been tough. You just saw uh, Catherine Baker is one of the, the, the best folks that you know, we had in, in Sacramento. Um, and, and so you have, to have a, you have to have a real honest look about it. Um, and so you know, right now we're going through a lot of soul searching. And rightfully so, at the statewide level, there's going to be state party elections coming up. 
This is the type of conversation that we need to be having. Again, not only for a party that can win, but a party that wins because you are connecting with issues and policies that matter to a very diverse spectrum of this state. The old way isn't working, guys, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so let's change that. But you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger said 10 years ago, you're dying at the box office. He was right. Yeah, and seems like you know, it's ready for a post-mortem, practically. Yeah. I mean, ha has the party hit rock bottom? Is there, is there anywhere lower to go? I, I in California. I, think I mean, in terms of just winning some, elections. We all have some pretty, as you know, strong views, and that's why we're here, because we care deeply uh, about it. Uh, you know, I just gave my State of the City speech uh, two weeks ago, and one said, climate change is real. I mean, that, that would have been like a big, you know, deal a couple of years ago in the Republican Party. And we, we need to make sure that we are, are connecting. We need to make sure that, um, that we are in touch with Californians. Again, a party that recognizes that and actually includes everyone as a party that is going to win. You know, Scott, there's two things that really underscore that Kevin is saying that are very, very important. When you run to serve your community, you are not running just to represent the Republicans in your community. Uh, and you're not the Republican Party's representative back to the district. That was one of the things that I found most rewarding about the opportunity to serve that I had and made me much more successful uh, working across the aisle and listening to all your constituents and willing to consider any good idea. That is a critical point that the Republican Party has to get and in, in consistent with your own values. And when you other, say the Republican Party has to get, like, what do you mean? Well, um, we, we, like any party, and you know that my Democratic colleagues, they have their own schisms and fights going on in theirs as well. But in a party infrastructure, you tend to be in an echo chamber. Who is, who is either more pure, who is either more righteous or more consistent with whatever your maybe written values are otherwise. And that's, that's who I mean is maybe activists and folks who are really wanting to see things done in California, you have got to work with people who don't agree with you 100% of the time. And if you're unwilling to listen to them, you're not gonna get very much done. And you probably won't be in a position to govern if you don't. I also wanna go and just say this, if you have any doubt in your mind that the, we might have hit rock bottom, take the Board of Equalization race in Southern California where Senator Joel Anderson, who was termed out as a, I think he was termed out, mm -hmm. as a yeah. state senator. This is, uh, I don't know the district, it may overlap actually in, in, with the San Diego area. Board of Equalization, not a lot of folks know exactly what the Board of Equalization does, but it is a partisan race. Your party registration is after your name on it. And Joel Anderson was a senator who represented an area, so people might know who he is, and running against someone who had bribery charges in the background, I think he was acquitted, spousal <laughs> abuse, um, had been disbarred, that person won. The guy with the D next. Well, let's not yes. forget Leland Yee. In a very I mean. conservative area. Well, true. I mean, <laughs> each party, I, I'm not so much saying that you know, one party more than the other has bad people in it, but if you want to get the message out of that, yeah. um, that is important for our party to get. You mentioned the state party convention, which is happening in a couple weeks up in Sacramento, and you know, the party's going to elect a new chair. Uh, and the chair, I would say, sets the tone for the party among others, but certainly that's an important, it's a, it's a reflection of where the party is. And from what I can tell, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like Travis Allen, who uh, ran for governor, lost to John Cock, lost the nomination, uh, and who is a, I would say, a Republican hardliner, certainly wants to build a wall, if I'm not mistaken, very much sort of, you know, hard, harsh rhetoric, I would say. So is that where the party needs to go? So, or, is there, or is there a different kind of message, kind of carrier of a message that the party should elect? I don't, I don't think Travis is, is going to win, and I don't think that's the, the direction where the party should go. I think that Jessica Patterson offers a, a much better alternative. Um, you know, as we saw in the, in the governor's race, you know, Travis is really good at showmanship, but, you know, he, he couldn't get the endorsement of the party you know, and, and he lost his own district to John Cox. But moving beyond that, uh, you know, the, the party definitely needs bold leadership, though. I think he's definitely hitting some tones. People want to see a bold, you know, some bold leadership that understands that we are Republicans and the people that are still left as Republicans, you know, do that, you know, willingly and knowing that, you know, like the electeds on the stage, that they carry a burden in doing so. And they want to see that improved upon and taking some of the ideas. I, you know, really quick, I actually want to give, you know, kudos to Catherine because I, I live, I'm a constituent of hers. And she did a good job explaining the cap and trade thing to our Republican Party and her constituents. You know, and, and Mayor Faulkner has done a really good job at, at you know, coming up with innovative ideas on how to serve as constituents. But again, we, we can't just have bright spots. 
We need to be doing this statewide in every office. And there are good examples of this, but it needs to be happening everywhere. And I also want to point out, this kind of goes back to my tactical and technical point, which is a lot of the things we're talking about is communicating and platform, I mean, not platform, but you know, messaging and coming up with ideas. We're not talking about substantial overhauls to our platform or becoming democratic light and everything. I think it's just, we need to go to communities we haven't gone to in a while. We need to be coming up with alternatives and updating the ways that we communicate. Um, and I think that the party, going back to the, the party question, is I think that, that Jessica is actually best suited, you know, best situated to do that. And I think that's ultimately what we need uh, is someone that understands the technical and tactical uh, side of it and can execute it. But if you I look, that, oh, go ahead, yeah. I, mean, Kristen, sure. yeah. I think what's also needed, though, is we need leaders at the highest level of the party who want to unify people, yeah. but who also want to give people who have felt so unrepresented and disenfranchised for so long, who want to give them a voice. Right? And I think some of the divisiveness we're hearing in California and at the national level today is speaking, oddly enough, to people who have felt mocked or disenfranchised or left behind or unrepresented for so many years. So if we can still speak to those people, but in a way that brings them into the fold and unifies people across a spectrum of ideas, then we'll have a foundation from which we can build. But as long as we continue to look to leaders and elect and appoint leaders, who want to divide people, then we're not going to grow as a party. And the reason this is so important, why you see all of us still working at it, is as Kevin said earlier, I've never seen a community, state, or nation that's healthy when it's operated under one party rule. You know, at worst case scenario, that leads to corruption and abuses of power, and maybe abuses of power is the best case scenario, and worst case scenario is corruption and authoritarian rule. That's not healthy for a state. The best public policy outcomes are created, the greatest number of Californians are served when people from different perspectives, different ideologies have to come to a table together and work to craft them. And so what's really important is that we continue to provide Provide, whether that's through the Republican Party or a new party or a movement, is that we provide contrasting alternatives and solutions to the problems facing our state today. So just as the Democratic caucuses are presenting solutions to today's challenges, so should we. And housing is a great example. It is a complete failure of the party if we're not presenting alternative solutions to that very pressing issue. You know, John Cox, when he ran uh, for governor, made housing a cornerstone of his campaign. He, was, he is a housing developer. And his main message was, let's you know, get rid of or re reduce regulation. Let's reform CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and so on. Uh, and there's a lot of merit to that. Uh, but does the party, Matt, do you think that it, you need to do more? Does there, like, for example, build inroads to labor or the environmental movement, which is really part of the reason that a lot of housing does not get built in California? Well, I think the housing issue is a perfect example of something that, A, it could potentially improve people's lives. Uh, rent in California is outrageous. Home prices in California are outrageous. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, whether you live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, you're feeling that problem. And more construction helps everybody. It increases the jobs, increases the economy, it drives down cost of living, and there's benefits to that. And I can tell you, everywhere we went, regardless of where it was in the state, it was an issue. It pulled very high. I mean, we went to an auto body shop in Berkeley a few days before the election, and everybody that worked at this auto body shop in Berkeley were commuting from Modesto every day. And they pointed at, a, at the apartment complex next door and they're like, it's $4,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment there. It's crazy. I'm in Modesto and I can do a fraction of that. And it, I mean, that's a great example of taking something that affects yeah. people's lives, improves their quality of life, and you hit it head on. Well, Mayor, you come up against these issues all the time. Mayors do. There is really little, unlike when you're in Sacramento, there's very little between the mayor's office and your constituents, right? And They remind me every time I'm at the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. Yeah, the grocery uh, store. And, and homelessness, I, you know, last time I was in San Diego, I think it was for the Republican Party convention, was there, there was a homeless, surprising amount of homelessness. And I'm wondering, you know, the party, in a lot of people's minds, stands for less government, less spending balanced budgets. Um, I'm wondering, as a mayor, you know, you look at the homeless problem or the cost of living and the lack of housing construction. I mean, do you, what role do you see for state government? I think we, we stand for effective government. And, the, and again, the ability to actually deliver solutions um, and the ability to reform and make changes when something's not working. And so you talk about the CEQA, 
Yes, that absolutely needs to be changed. The status quo is not working in California. Too often, CEQA is used as a weapon to stop good quality projects, housing that Californians can afford from being constructed. Um, it is time to say yes. It's time to get away from the not in my backyard and to say yes in my backyard, where it makes sense along transit corridors and, and others in multifamily housing. Again, the status quo isn't working. The, the top issues in California, homelessness and housing, it's in San Diego, it's in San Francisco, it's in Modesto, it's in Sacramento. And so if we do not take a different approach, what makes us think mm. that we're going to change that equation? Um, one other thing, when you get back to it, and because I'm spending a whole lot of time right now really trying to push the envelope in San Diego on affordable housing. One of our biggest sources uh, of affordable housing was redevelopment. And the state legislature got rid of that six years ago. That worked, ladies and gentlemen. Redevelopment zones worked. It worked in San Diego. It worked in other places. Again, we need to... It wasn't without its policy. problems, though. I think you'd agree. I, I, in some areas. I, I, the, the problems that... Uh, alleged problems in other, other places were like this compared to the benefit that it worked, again, in cities all across. And so we, you start to wonder why we're having some of the issues that we have on homelessness yeah. and others. Again, back to why you want that competition of ideas, why you want to be able to, to talk about, about, about problems, but also different solutions other than just... Well, we have to keep doing this because that's what my party wants us to yeah. do in Sacramento. Yeah. You know, you mentioned homelessness and housing being the big issues. I was looking at some polling data today, uh, statewide voter poll. Number one issue, immigration and the illegal immigration, both. And of course, you know, you can look at that issue and you're going to see very different solutions. Uh, people, according to that poll, at least, and others that I've seen, really don't like the wall, but they do want effective border security. And I'm just wondering, to what extent do you think, a lot of people would say that the beginning of the demise of the party happened in 1994 with Prop 187. It turned, it sort of mobilized a generation of Latinos and really they're now the cornerstone of the Democratic Party. What, what can, do you agree with that analysis and, and what can be done? I do. Jack Kemp came out back, way back then and warned the California Republican Party, if you guys don't wise up, this is not going to end well. And we've seen that starting way back then. I, I think, you know, the immigration issue is tricky because I think it changes based on the region in some ways. I think there are some parallels across the board, but certainly where I'm from in the San Joaquin Valley region, immigration is so fundamentally important to the bread and butter of our economy and our ability to experience economic growth. You need workers. And, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And these folks that people love to talk about in the press in unfair ways, they're our neighbors, they're my kids' classmates at school. And so the rhetoric out there is making people feel like they're less than human. And it's just <coughs> not okay. And so I do think immigration is a very important issue for uh, Republicans to tackle head on. I know we've voted for so many yep. different bills and resolutions trying to urge the federal government to take a comprehensive approach to fixing our broken immigration system. Yes, it involves secure borders uh, in the way that that looks like, but it also includes what do we do to allow people to earn legal status, to earn citizenship, to become productive members of society here, as many of them already are. So I think this is a fundamental issue that we have to address. And it, it, it also is going to determine what our future is in this state, because, um, you know, I'm very pro-immigration. I believe it is undeniable what a positive Im impact immigration has had, including people who are refugees from countries that are in a total mess and mean to do the United States harm. It is good for us. If you look at Ronald Reagan's, and I, I know that was a while ago, but if you look at his farewell address to the United States where he talked about the shining city on the hill, take just a minute to listen to that. He was talking about a country where people who want to get here can get here and make an amazing contribution. You don't hear that from Republicans in Washington very much right now. And he uh, would say, and if there have to be walls, the walls have, have doors. doors. That's so America. people can get in. We both know the same speech. This is good. <laughs> Great speech. Um, but just to be clear, you think that's a bad <laughs> metaphor, are you saying? That the, the, a wall with a door? What do you, what do you, that, not necessarily his point, if you watch the whole speech, his point was we have open doors here in America. We want to welcome people welcoming. from all well, over the world who are seeking yeah. a better yeah. way yeah. of life yeah. right here. And, and so it is critical for our party to, to ch I believe, to choose a path, and frankly, I think Kevin's been a terrific leader on this um, in, in, in San Diego, uh, of a welcoming immigration policy. And just underscore, 
at Kristen's point, it can't just be we're only going to do DACA, which I firmly support we need to do. We're only going to do border security. Uh, it needs to be comprehensive immigration reform. Yep. Mayor, what is, what is it like for you to hear the President of the United States come down to your border, talk about the crime-ridden area around the border, uh, talk about the need for a wall, uh, display a lack of sensitivity, I guess you would say, or uh, knowledge about the kind of commerce that goes back and forth. Like, what is that like for you as a Republican mayor? It gives me an opportunity to talk about our story of success hmm. in San Diego. Um, That's very measured. Thing. And the, um, very good. <laughs> and the, well, and I had to talk about it a lot. I mean, and, and before, I mean, we are the largest uh, land port of entry in North America, in San Diego. Um, we were just ranked as the safest big city in America last year. Um, that's due to a lot of hard work of our men and women that wear the badge every day. But that gets to the point of how when there's, there's perception and then there's the reality. And I talk a lot about that story of success. And I don't talk about you know, traveling to Mexico, I talk about going next door to see our neighbor and why I've made that such a big part of what we are doing in San Diego. Our region, when we talk about um, our jobs, our economy, our culture. We're, we don't talk about two cities, San Diego and Tijuana. We talk about one region. And, and again, that is a success story that we build upon, that I welcome the opportunity to, to talk about that, to get the facts out about that. Um, I talk about building bridges because that is what we are doing, literally and figuratively in San Diego. I just opened, um, opened we just announced the opening of, a, of an immigrant position in San Diego yesterday. Got a lot of, uh, we've been working on it for a year and a roadmap and a, and a blueprint. Just to, to echo what you just heard from, from my colleagues. Immigrants are the story of success for this country. It's the st story of success for California and certainly in San Diego, not just for the past, but for the future. When we recognize that, when we foster that, when we make it easier for new Americans, um, our city and our state is much stronger. So do you ever pick up the phone and say to the White House, stop denigrating my city, you're misrepresenting what's happening. I don't speak for the president. Um, I certainly speak for, for us in San Diego. And I no, think I'm saying not for the president, to the president. I mean, do you ever call up I've, the White House? We've, or? we've led our positions very clear uh, with, with a lot of folks. And, and again, it is, it, it is a, um, it's an opportunity to, to talk about what's happening, what, what really is, is, is going on in San Diego. Um, I welcome that opportunity because, again, it's a story of success and a neighborhood and a partnership with, uh, with our friends and our neighbors. And I think it's important to underscore, underscore that safe communities and encouraging immigration are not mutually exclusive. Those don't have to be separate goals. In fact, our criminal activities in California are much lower today than they've been in the past. Our rates of both violent crime and in communities across the state. Now, what's important is we emphasize the importance of safe communities and we provide communities with the tools and the resources and the laws that they need in order to protect those communities um, and keep them safe for everyone. But, but those are not mutually exclusive from also encouraging immigration that helps our economy thrive. And it really is about the fundamentals of, of what America has always stood for. When you think about the state of California, the status of California. I mean, there are a lot of good things happening. There have been a lot of jobs created. We're, some would say, a leader on environmental issues. But at the same time, it's unaffordable for a lot of people. You know, try to buy a house if you're a young family or a young person. Um, it, it, there's a lot of poverty. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the country and some of the worst outcomes for children in the country. Uh, why you would think that is a ripe environment for another party to come in and say, try us. But that just it, it, that doesn't seem to be getting any traction. Well, I think it's because we have to get better at speaking to those issues and presenting solutions to those very issues. You're right, there's huge opportunity there because that has all taken place under long-term one-party rule in this state. A matter of degree, whether it's been a simple majority or two-thirds majority or now a three-quarters super, super majority, it's all happened within that time frame. But that alone, that dynamic, is not going to build a second party in and of itself. It has to be driven by solutions being offered to address those very issues in a way that everyday folks can understand. You know, most people aren't paying as much attention as all of we are. They're trying to figure out how to get their kid to school every day while they're also supposed to be at the office at the same time. They're trying to figure out how can I save enough money to send my, my son to soccer camp who desperately wants to be able to play soccer um, in college or whatever. How am I going to even be able to afford to 
just send them to college. You know, these are the struggles that people think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So how can we tap into the noise of their life and present ideas and solutions and principles that can help address things that are, are facing so many of our communities, whether it's poverty or the many other issues you talked about? Yeah, and I, I would just say, I think that's a symptom of having one party dominance. When you have people who all agree with one another in the majority or a vast majority, um, you're not bringing other viewpoints to the table and you will not have as effective and lasting policies that are good for California. We have one quarter of the entire country's homeless population in our state. Our education system is we're 45th and 46th in math and reading for our kids. And um, we, you, housing, we've talked a good bit about. Transportation, we've talked just the cost of living in this state. And that has been all under one primary party's dominance in the state. When you don't have those solutions that involve both sides, uh, you don't get very effective outcomes. And I, I just really think that's important to underscore. It's never good for anyone when you don't ever have to talk to the other side. And I do believe that, that that's an example of how just having one voice and one set of solutions in the room is, um, is not serving Californians well. I want to point to one thing real quickly, because <laughs> I think it's important to leave people with hope, right? It could be depressing the state that we're in, but there, there are opportunities beyond just growing a new viable party or rebuilding what was once a viable party. I'm part of a collaborative right now. It's called the Economic <laughs> Mobility Collaborative. And it's a transpartisan uh, opportunity or a multipartisan effort where there are many of us at the table, Republicans, Democrats, Green Party individuals, Libertarians, business leaders, community leaders, elected officials, nonprofit leaders, all getting together around issues of economic mobility and trying to figure out how could we, one, provide ideas to the elected leaders in our state. We've now sent our second letter just yesterday to Governor Newsom all about economic mobility. How do we give people in all areas of our state the opportunity to improve their lives economically? How can we address issues of childhood poverty to make a statistically significant difference What's a Republican in bringing people kind of out of poverty. Um, I, you know, that we're working on some of those things. So we're in the very early stages, but the earned income tax credit has been proven effective in a number of areas across our nation and in our state to give people the opportunity to become productive in society and help them along the way as they're growing out of that. Um, providing opportunities for them to earn educational degrees or certificates that can then help them be better, uh, more employable. And so there are opportunities happening even now under one party rule that's bringing people of different ideologies and perspective together to better inform policy in Sacramento and Newsom's administration and elsewhere that can speak to many of these issues. Okay. Let me just get mad at it. I've been usually quiet for a while. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I think a lot of this is actually the essence of what John Cox was running on in the general election. And, you know, even though he lost, when it's all things considered, he really did outperform a lot of Republicans throughout the state. And, you know, going back to his bus tour was the help is on the way bus tour, whereas, you know, and it showed how much people Gavin's bus tour was the Gavin bus tour and his name and his, his face on it. But one thing that we used to talk about in the campaign is, you know, Republicans talk about tax cuts and CEQA and small government and stuff, but that doesn't mean anything to people at the door. And when we used to talk about like addressing rent and housing costs is imagine going to a, an apartment, a renter and telling them that, yeah, the housing crisis is terrible, you know, and they're going to look at you and go, well, how, do you, how are you going to lower my rent in six months? It's an entirely different conversation than addressing a lot of these other issues on a higher level. And so to Kristen's point, we need to be much better at communicating our, our platform and our philosophy in a much more granular way that is understandable and convey that affects people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis rather than having a, a large philosophical conversation with people. And that was one thing we really tried to capture on John's campaign was really the essence of it's about people. It's not about business owners and all this other stuff. Catherine? Well, I mean, you you'd asked a, a good question, which is what are some Republican ideas for, d for dealing with those very issues? I was just going to give a couple of ideas. You know, uh, One, for example, is when the uh, gas tax came forward. And I, I just believe, and I think Republicans largely agree, that when you, we didn't deny that there was a need for transportation spending and investment in that, but if you're going to raise someone's taxes, you had better make sure you are spending it wisely. You should make the reforms necessary for how that's being spent. You should have accountability. You should not index it to inflation. Um, so that's one example. Another one is uh, the minimum wage. Uh, it's, it's traditionally been a, a democratic policy to, to set a minimum wage of, say, $15 an hour for the state of California, and this is what everybody gets. Ignoring the need for regional minimum wages, 
for minimum wages that are scaled to those who are maybe teenagers and entering the workforce with low skills for the first time, as opposed to someone who uh, is building up skills, completely ignored the possibility of, of shutting out those who have developmental disabilities from the workforce because you don't have a structured minimum wage that gives employers incentives to make sure you are opening their jobs to everyone. Those are just some examples. Uh, in childcare, there's more. The list is long. We should have a whole other yeah. program on that. <laughs> um, so many of the um, childcare program ideas that we see come out of Sacramento or maybe one party rule is let's have this one place you can go to for childcare and that's it. As opposed to empowering parents to make the choice to match their child with the best early childhood education or childcare possible for their own child. Those are differences in Republican and Democrat policies. What you shouldn't see is one party saying, that's not a priority of Californians, so I can talk about something else like big government and regulations, and that's it. Um, that's a contrast. Yeah. So again, we're going to do this program on... Yeah, I'm <laughs> happy right. to. There's lots more to talk about. Uh, audience question, what do you think is the greatest strength or appeal of the Republican Party in California? I'm going to ask you, Kristen. <laughs> mm, um, boy, I got to... Get, you want to get back to us? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do think... Let me just ask you, have you, yeah. and I'll put it to uh, all of you, the, the descriptions of the policies you support could easily, you could easily find yourself in the Democratic Party uh, toward the middle. I'm not saying you're going to agree with a lot of other things, but have you thought about changing parties, leaving the party, or, you know, even if it goes, means going to no party preference, but also just joining the Democratic Party? Have you thought about that? I would say a lot of the Democrats would believe a lot of things that we've been talking about tonight. Um, and, and again, if, if, if we just focused on solutions that we thought would appeal to just registered Republicans, you wouldn't get very far in California. You wouldn't get very far in San Diego. When we talk about a lot of the things that we're talking about and how we do them, then you appeal to a large segment, not just independents, but a lot of Democrats that care about where their money's being spent want infrastructure done the right way, you know, want to make the reforms for housing that we need to be doing, knowing that we need to do different things on homelessness because it's not working. Um, when, when we talk about it in those terms, um, I think there'll be plenty of folks on, on all sides that, that want actual solutions. I would say, to be honest and transparent, I think about it weekly. I, I do not think about re-registering as a member of the Democratic Party. I have many times thought about re-registering, no party preference, and I've spent a lot of time soul-searching, thinking, have I changed? It, it, do I somehow think differently than I used to, or did my party leave me? And those are hard questions if you're trying to really do an honest self-assessment. And every time I come back to, no, I still believe in what at least were the fundamental principles of the conservative movement, of the Republican movement, limited government, balanced budgets, freedom, liberty. Now with liberty comes responsibility, economic opportunity, educational excellence. And I believe those are the fundamental principles that, that formed our party to begin with, right? We were the party about civil rights and giving every person, no matter their background, a greater opportunity to thrive in America, not just survive. And those are the fundamental principles I believe in, and I am hopeful that we can get back to the day when those are the principles we're known for again. But it's not easy uh, trying to survive in this current climate, and so I have to be honest, I have many times thought about whether it's time to re-register and try to build some new movement or some third party. It's a struggle. And I would say, and I heard, I heard this from constituents who are Republicans, or former Republicans, and uh, there's, if you're, if you are not in the Trump part of, I don't even know that it's our party, but uh, if you're not, if you're critical of President Trump and you don't believe he represents Republican values or in many ways what you think are good American values, you are going to think about being in a different party. Um, for the most part with constituents that I had, and even myself, it wasn't, gee, do you go to the Democratic Party? Because, and I don't think we should go down the list again of where there are shortcomings in the Democratic Party. A lot of the things we've talked about tonight have not been addressed very well in many instances by one party Democratic rule. But um, the very things that make, have made us Republicans deserve a voice fighting for them. 
And constituents came up to me, whether they were Democrats, independents, or Republicans, and said, please keep fighting for those values because they matter in California, they matter in this country, and they don't feel like there's anybody else speaking for them anymore. And, and you're talking to someone who represented not just a purple district, but a very blue district uh, by any measure now in terms of its registration. And over a third, sometimes 37% of the people who voted for me were not Republican. They were from a different party or right. independent or otherwise. And um, that you know, represents a viewpoint that folks don't feel like any one party is, is resting very well mm -hmm. with them. And you see that all across California. Matt, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, you know, I, I just uh, was reelected to chairman of my, my county party, and I was a spokesman for the uh, Republican uh, gubernatorial nominee, so I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. Never actually thought about what does keep me up at night is what we're talking about is what, what, what is our future? How do we move forward and how do we build? And, you know, having lived in the Bay Area for a while and talking to my peers out here, you know, in Berkeley and San Francisco, I think it goes back to they want responsibility. They want our, our money wisely spent and they don't want, you know, waste. One of my favorite examples a few years ago was when they were building the new Bay Bridge that the city of San Francisco or Cal, I think it was Caltrans, spent like 60 or $70 million to move like a flock of birds from the one old bridge to the new bridge. And but you hear about that, and it's like they go. But then you look at the San Francisco infrastructure and Caltrans infrastructure. Like, where's all the money going? Well, they're trying to move a flock of birds. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that can move a flock of birds for sixty million dollars. Um, but it's just the type of waste and that type of thing that just turns people off. And I think that we've come up short in providing an alternative to that, and that's where we really need to hit our stride. Mary you said. Uh earlier that a lot of the positions that Catherine and Kristen were describing are things that people agree with you on, and, and there was a reference to the gas tax repeal uh, as well, uh, Prop 5, 6 rather, uh, and that was the cornerstone of John Cox's campaign, really. He paid, I think, to help collect those signatures to get that on the ballot, mm -hmm. and that lost, I could be wrong, but it lost in almost every county, I think. Um, and I think, I'm wondering, what, like, what do you make of that? Because that is, a, you know, that low tax position is sort of a classic Republican uh, position, and you would think it would be appealing to people because gas tax is a very regressive tax, but, and yet it, it wasn't. Why? Well, I mean, I think every, every campaign is unique, and, you know, how much is it funded and getting the messaging out is incredibly important. Um, but I'm, I'm going to go back to, and Catherine got to this, and I feel strongly about it as well, the need to actually reform the system before you throw a lot more money at it. Uh, I think when we talk about that, whether it's the gas tax, whether it's you know, a variety of things, particularly pension uh, issues, which uh, the great crowd out is happening in California because of that. Yeah. If we do not reform that, ladies and gentlemen, all of the things that we hold dear and services and others, we're going to get a whole lot less of. That's the type of thing that is important that we, and we don't talk about it just in terms of reform, but we talk about it in terms of why the change will actually make a difference in our neighborhoods for dollars that we can spend on priorities that Californians want. Mm. I think it also highlights, you know, speaking now again as a local elected official back at the county level, I think it highlights how um, much in need our transportation networks are, certainly in the San Joaquin Valley, certainly here in the Bay Area, whether it's traffic congestion between corridors or even just potholes within communities, people are seeing every day how much our roads are in need of investment. Was it the perfect package? By no sense of the word was it. Should it have included reforms? Yes. But once it was passed by the legislature, I think it became a very difficult task to convince people that the road money that's now here, and in our community, for example, in the, same, the ballot just before, we passed a local half-cent sales tax to match those funds, that now they're seeing all these very specific projects. I will say the anti-Prop 6 campaign did a very good job in their messaging in rolling out. These are the very specific projects you're going to see funded in your community. And that became very very difficult to vote against, even in the context of higher taxes. I, I, I want to jump in on that, though. I wish the EV team could put up a pie chart of the spending on the yes side and the no side, because, I mean, the, the yes on Prop 6 was dramatically outspent. But you know, by was, a lot of that was your, of money. your part of your base. That was the Chamber of Commerce, the business community. I, you know, right. I, I've heard that, you know, up there they've decided that trying to team up with the Democrats and trying to reel in some of their extravagance is kind of the, the new course. I also, I agree with, with uh, what Kristen was just saying about the messaging, which is, 
you know, when you're the roads, are, I mean, everybody doesn't like traffic. And when the roads are falling apart and the traffic's really bad, everybody, they don't want to see that, an opportunity for that to be solved to go away. And in Kristen's credit, I believe it was under your leadership that the, the Assembly Caucus actually, the Republican Assembly Caucus actually introduced a comprehensive transportation plan that would have addressed all these funding concerns years before the gas tax was voted on. And, you know, that's an opportunity we could, you know, seize upon moving forward is by, that's a good example of what I talk about, is coming up with alternatives and marketing it. But I think we need to do a lot more of them more aggressively. Here's an interesting audience question. As a young person, how do you get me excited about the California Republican brand? Well, there's a couple of, as a parent of two teenagers, so I'm, I'm already indoctrinating them yeah. young. <laughs> um, I would say, how much do you want to have a say in what happens in your life it's very difficult to articulate for someone what freedom is when we've had it and uh, we get to pick uh, what do we want to study in school? Where do we want to live? Where do we want to go? What do we want to do with the dollars that we work very hard for? Um, so I would try to say we, we, that's one area is do you want to have more control and autonomy over your life? Or do you want some other entity that's involved in a lot more of your life and what it gets to be? So that that's one element. And um, ultimately, how much are we... Um, appealing to people who don't look like everyone else, but you know, in our party, that having a more diverse party to say that it's for you. Um, those are two ways that I would look at it, a much more inclusive party. Do you think that would overcome other things like the parties, generally speaking now, not you specifically, but you, the party's position on climate change, which young people care about a lot, same-sex marriage, civil rights, voting rights. I mean, there, those are positions, I think, and Matt, you know, maybe you can, you know, speak to this too, but I hear from younger people that is a deal breaker for, for a lot of them. This is something I'm actually incredibly passionate about because I have some, some life-defining experiences. I remember in 1991, 1992, I was young, and um, Bill Clinton, when he was campaigning for president. Well, you're president, younger than all of us on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I, yeah. Um, you know, Bill, Bill, you know I, my, my family on my, you know, was pretty Republican, and Bill Clinton came on Nickelodeon and talk to kids about kids' issues on Nickelodeon. And, you know, my dad listened to Rush Limbaugh every day, and I had to, you know, I sat in his car and listened to Rush Limbaugh with him. But after seeing, you know, Bill Clinton on Nickelodeon, I was like, Dad, you know, he's got some really cool ideas. He's trying to help kids. You know, why don't you vote for Bill Clinton? Uh, and I think that a lot of times as political consultants and as candidates, we look at, you know, who is the narrow universe of people that can vote for me right now? While that's incredibly important to winning the election at hand, we need to be much more long-term focused on, you know, going after the younger crowd. Um, I, I really like what Catherine had to say about the freedom is I think there's a lot of confusion amongst young people who tend to be more rebellious that we are the party of freedom and choice and opportunity and choosing your own path and doing your own thing. And the Democrats are really trying to put more control on your life. You know, finally, I think we need to be more hip. Uh, you know, recently Kanye came out as a, you know, as a, uh, as a Trump supporter and he had a song called Ye vs. the People. And I thought that, you know, that kind of had some momentum and it's kind of faded away. You know, we had Kim Kardashian and him go to the White House. There needs to, I mean, you know, they've really conquered the culture war. You know, I mean, I remember I went and watched Vice twice in the theater during Christmas. And to see like an A-list movie with A-list actors just savage our party. And they did it with Sarah Palin. They did it with W. They did it with all of them. And I try to think, when's the last time, you know, that happened towards a Democrat? And it's like we get Dinesh D'Souza's movies that go straight to Netflix half the time. And, and they've really just beat us on the culture war. And I think that's something that we need to be much more aggressive in attacking. I'm wondering. Yeah, Catherine, I, I, go ahead. I yeah. do want to say this. Yeah. You're right about climate change and some of the other issues. It goes back to what we've said a few times here, which is what are the issues that matter? I don't think you have to change your values, but mm. you have to address the issues that people yeah. have as priority and affect their daily lives, whether you're a younger person or otherwise. And if, the, if, if parties or any leadership is tone deaf to doing that, then they have a problem that you should even give them a chance. So uh, that's very important here in all seriousness, but yeah. I, I think that's critical. And it's one of the areas, you know, the electorate in 2018 changed dramatically in the last few days of the election. It, it became much younger. There was a much, much higher turnout among 18 to 31 year olds than had been predicted in any midterm election at all, particularly in the last 48 hours. And so um, they made their voices heard and you've got to be listening to them. Uh, I, and I was just going to back just on a, um, the issue of climate change, it's not only the issue, but how you, how you actually propose the solution and how you, how you want to make it reality. Um, the, the tact that I took was 
this needs to be not just an environmental or a business issue. Let's get everybody together and come up with a plan that we can actually get endorsed with widespread support that the entire community would get behind. It's one of the most aggressive climate action plans of any city in the country. We're going to be ahead of the state in terms of hitting 100 percent renewable can you by 2035. The message, I'm sorry, can you overcome yep, yep. the message that you know, climate change is, is a hoax from the president? A absolutely. It, it, and we, and we, we're doing it, and, and we've done it. Um, and that's why, and then you tap into that because it's, you know, our, our clean air, our clean water, our environment, it's in our DNA in, in Californians. It's part of who we are. And so we, f we feel very strongly about protecting that and about doing it actually in a way that's going to achieve the goals, not just a, a policy statement. And that's why you have to have the buy-in of the business community, of the environmental community. Again, I wasn't interested in making just a statement. I was interested in a policy that's going to outlast me and from a sustainability standpoint and an action standpoint, it's actually going to achieve the results. And so when we're talking about community choice energy right now, which we are moving forward with in San Diego, folks said, oh, San Diego's never going to do that. Well, we're going to do it. We have the largest water, uh, pure water project, water recycling project in California going on right now. Um, all of these, to me, these are not Republican ideals. These are common sense ideals, environmental ideals that we have to do from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, when we do it in that way, we're, we're, it's going to be accepted. We're going to get it across the finish line. I've, I've been mayor for six years. I've always had a majority Democrat city council. You better be able to work with people if you want to get results that matter. I think I've the other thing to appeal to young voters is we have to start talking about the future of work. I, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, I was going to change the world, right? I never, I never doubted for a second that I was going to be able to get a job after college. I had all sorts of, I had to narrow down what I wanted to do, right? That's different today. When I talk to my kids, when I talk to their friends, there's much more fear and trepidation about, one, getting into college, two, if they even want to go to college, and three, what are they going to do? How are they going to make money? How are they going to get a job? What is a job? Um, as, as things are just changing, is it more about income generation? And am I going to have the freedom to be able to pick and choose what I want to do and when I want to do it? I mean, the whole universe is changing when it comes to work. And I think to have that conversation, nobody's really having that conversation right now. And I think that that's something that really would appeal to young voters and is an opportunity for whichever party decides to grab that. Well, I'm afraid we are out of time, but thank Thank you all so much. Former Assembly members Catherine Baker, Kristen Olson, Mayor Faulkner, yeah. Matt Shoup. I'm Scott Schaefer, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Oh, yeah.